Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I'm speaking with Victor Davis Hanson, an American classicist, military historian, columnist, and farmer. He is a professor emeritus of classics at California State University, the Martin and Illy Anderson Senior Fellow in Classics and Military History at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, as well as the visiting professor at Hillsdale College. He is a regular writer at the National Review and author of many books, including his most recent, The Case for Trump. Today we discuss whether the American president is a Greek hero, what are the ancient parallels to cancel culture and monument rules, as well as the value of ancient history. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a Society member and help support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click start here. So thank you so much for taking your time to speak with me today. Uh, very much appreciate it. I, I just wanted to say, so here at Classical Wisdom, one of the things we sort of strive to do is to show how the classics um, are still really relevant today and how they can be sort of an important source of wisdom in our modern world. And, you know, this works for, for learning lessons from ancient examples, but, you know, also with regards to approaching difficulties and, and especially controversial issues. So I often like telling people, you know, the Stoics are very helpful for being able to hear different opinions and not necessarily be offended, but to think rationally as, as well as the skeptics, you know, suspend judgment when hearing different views so that you can actually hear them. So these are some of the ways in which I find that the ancient world can be helpful in dealing with our very modern notions. And so as a yourself, a classicist, I know you also have a lot of uh, opinions on current events. And so I, I would like to hear from you kind of what do you think of the modern notions of like the cancel culture or being woke or collective guilt? And do they have comparable ancient examples? And what can we learn from those? Yeah, I'll just preface that comment by saying that most things in the ancient world uh, have parallels in the modern or at least the modern world if it looks at the Renaissance or the Enlightenment or the middle, middle or Dark Ages, there's echoes of the ancient world. And prior to the ancient world, not so much. So it's a, it's a friend, it's a crutch, it's a, an aid to go to to make sure that you're not crazy or you're not alone and that you've seen it all before. So if you take cancel culture or statue toppling, we have iconoclasm that starts in the Eastern Empire uh, and last for about 300 years during the Byzantine period. Statue toppling was a little bit more economical because there was a standard body set type and you could decapitate a Roman emperor's head and then substitute another one. We haven't done that yet, but uh, we may get there. So there was damnatio memoriae, and that was that we Trotskyized, Trotskyized people's names so that they were no longer mentioned or their relatives no longer existed. In ancient Athens, uh, depending on the year, 6,000 to a little over 6,000 votes were required to ostracize someone. And that was important because it was similar to cancel culture. There, wasn't hap there was no need in a court of law or in a dispassionate, disinterested fashion to prove real culpability. It was basically a mob reaction to unpopularity. Almost everybody who was significant in ancient Athens at one time or another was ostracized. So we have all of those, uh, you know, the idea of hate off, shaming. We have uh, the ancient world was not a modern guilt culture. That is, it wasn't something, there wasn't a notion of private transgression between you and your God in the Christian sense. And that's where we are now because we're largely in the West and either an atheistic or agnostic society. And we don't really see private sin as something that imperils our mortal soul and as something for us to, to look for guidance and religious scriptures and things to address. And rather it's a shame culture where we try to enforce poor public morality by making fun of people or attacking the way they think 
are, are ostracizing people around them, are making it hard for their employer to uh, to hire them. And when you look at the forensic speeches of Demosthenes, Eschines, and a lot of Lysias, Isaiah's inheritance cases, there's an effort to, to create a, a picture of an opponent that he's just, uh, in every aspect of the of manner, is, is not to be liked and not to be associated with. So if Demosthenes doesn't like Eschines, besides policy difference, you've got to know that maybe Eschines' mother committed prostitution in a public bathroom or something. And it's that type of cancel culture that's very similar to the ancient world, at least at times. And we also have the mob in the third book of Thucydides' history. He has that chilling um, exegesis of the revolution at Corsaira where words change their names and reality is not what we seem. And the key word there is the blunter wits win. And by that, he means those who just saw what was at stake, they understood violence was the answer. They went out and decapitated their enemies, didn't think twice about it, didn't try to over-rationalize or see this or trim here and they, they were successful. Sort of like Hitler's brown shirts or the Nazi move. They were the blunter wits from the underclasses and they were used to thuggery. And I think in today's Western protest, there's a sense that you don't really have to justify whether, uh, you know, Robert E. Lee is any different than James T. Longstreet. They're both Confederate or maybe Frederick Douglass. He's not up to your current standards of uh, wokeness. You just go out and do it. And you do it because you want to do it. And you say to people, what are you going to do about it? And Thucydides saw that as a very dangerous uh, development in society, that the Bonnerwitz would, would prevail. And so if, if you have the knowledge of these ancient events, and does that help shape uh, a response or a view? I mean, you know, they say history, those who know history, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, but those who know history are doomed to watch others repeat it. Um, is there anything you can do with that kind of knowledge? Well, you have to be careful because everybody left and everybody right sees, thinks that they have the only insight into the true lessons of history. And, it, and their views or exegesis is conditioned by their modern proclivities. But that being said, there is a universal, and that is that you're not alone, that you, you don't wake up in the morning and think you're the most important person and your 2020 is a post, this has never happened before, whether it's the ancient world or the French Revolution. You can see parallels and you can see how people on both sides dealt with them and you pre can predict what's going to happen. So at Corsaira or uh, in the revolution of 411 in Athens or the career of Theramenes, you can see or what Xenophon talks about in the first and second book of his history. You can see what happens in these revolutionary cycles. Eventually they all, and the 30 tyrants are the same thing as we know from Xenophon as well. They start to peter out because the logical rational trajectory is that nobody is ever going to be able to satisfy their claims on revolutionary purity and authenticity and genuineness. And so they start, whether it's Robespierre or the 30, they start turning on their own. And they say, well, yesterday's revolutionary is today's counter-revolutionary. We're seeing that in the contemporary field of some sense that today if we're speaking a prominent moderate voice at the New York Times, very wise, just resigned and said there's no place for her because she's been canceled out. And we're starting to see 150 liberal writers, artists, celebrities of sorts write to Harper's and say this is not sustainable because now they're going after us. And that's sort of reminiscent of the reign of terror between 1793 and four when the Jacobins finally devoured Jacobins and they put an end to it. So Things like that, those trends that are not so controversial, I think are very helpful. Um, you mentioned before the Dimnatio Memore. Uh, during the Roman time period, you know, that was a very common thing to do, say, topple Caligula or, or one of those guys who, you know, had just been murdering your family. And, and, and when I think of a modern parallel to that, tearing down the statues of Stalin or Saddam, you know, again, a very recent um, trauma in your life. 
but would you have had any ancient examples of people tearing down statues uh, referring to incidences that had happened hundreds of years beforehand rather than just the most recent tyrant? No, I mean, I, I think you could argue that when there were destructions, deliberate destructions of icons, it was more a thus, them, us, foreign, domestic, Persians coming in after Thermopylae, for example, and destroying uh, sanctuaries or shrines in Boeotia, or after the Persian War, uh, the Greeks coming together and arguing whether they are, should or should not rebuild the temples and statuary that uh, the Persians had destroyed, or there was a topos in ancient literature that when certain thugs were short of money, especially in the post-classical period, they, in the fourth century onward, BC, they would raid Delphi and strip off uh, precious metals from some of the statues. But it was always more uh, careerist, more fiscal, more monetary than it was ideological. And uh, I think we in the United States have had periods of this, the Salem Wish Trials, the McCarthy period, but we've never, that I remember, and I'm speaking as someone 66, we've never had people go after statues with so little rationale. I mean, it started with anybody that had a Confederate uniform and any statue of bronze or stone that was put up in the South has to come down or even the North. And then, as I said, it went to anybody who seemed to be not of this century, a Teddy Roosevelt or a Ulysses S. Grant. So we, we very quickly got away from the idea that Confederate racist mediocrities are what we're gonna focus on and that will somehow make us feel better and solve social problems if we destroy that icon, a, a graphic expression. But we didn't, we didn't stay there long. We, we morphi, metamorphized into almost anything of the Father Sarah, as I said, it can be Teddy Roosevelt, it can be Ulysses S. It can be Frederick Douglass, it can be black Civil War veterans because it's a puritanical expression that you have to be, to be good, you have to be perfect. And this pampered generation that has more leisure and affluence and technological appurtenances than any, any uh, generation in history really does believe, unlike Hesiod's warning, that with technological or material progress comes ethical progress, whereas the Greeks, I think you could argue, there's a long strain in Homer from the windy lectures by uh, Nestor or Hesiod especially, that with material progress comes the danger of ethical regress. That, it's, that people have to keep busy, they have to keep working and when they're idle and wealthy, and there is a anti-aristocratic and anti-plutocratic uh, flavor in Greek literature for that reason. Um, so speaking of the of ethics and good morals, um, uh, you've written before about heroes, um, specifically in your book, The Case for Trump, and when you liken the president to a hero, but with the very important caveat of what an ancient Greek hero is, uh, which is quite a bit different than I think what most people think heroes are like. Um, do you still feel this is the case today? And maybe more importantly, are Greek heroes something that we want in our modern world? Are they something to look up to? Well, there was an important adjective that I added in that book, and that was tragic heroes. I mean, we have epic heroes, we have heroes, we have tragic heroes. Usually a tragic hero, and the locus classicus is the seven extant plays of Sophocles, Ajax, Philoctetes, Antigone, Oedipus, is that they have a flawed, uh, they have a, something that's a um, hemartia, a sin. And that is revealed in times of stress or disruption or crisis. And it seems to consume them. And even though they can be of great value because they're outliers, they're not part of this polite society, the methodology which they use to solve a crisis is also the one that makes them unfit. So we know that Antigone is the only one who has the courage to bury her brother, but she does so in such an off-putting manner, there's really no place for her because she, she'll solve the problem, 
and show that women should not be judged by their gender, but by their personalities and their in, innate essence. But by proving that, she's also not going to be comfortable either on her own part or by society's part. Same as Ajax. By all accounts, Ajax was the better warrior than Odysseus. He was blunt, he was simple, black and white, Manichaean view of the world, and yet he doesn't get the armor of Achilles. And he rails and he's angry, and there's no place for a guy like that in a modern polis society. I could go on, but that was very influential in the American Western, and I pointed that out in the book, but John Ford, as well as others, and if you look in the 1950s, coming out of the post-war era, there was a series of movies, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance with John Wayne, The Searchers with John Wayne, The Magnificent Seven, John Sturge's movie with Yul Brenner, and uh, Shane was probably the most iconic with Gary Cooper, and the, the plot's all the same. The, the, the so-called townspeople, the polis, in other words, the city-state, is at an impasse whether it's a Mexican village or it's Hadleyville or it's an effort to find a missing girl that's been kidnapped. And they need somebody who is not of them. In other words, they're willing to do things and say things that reflect the way it really is without convention, without mannerism. And they're very successful. Shane will take out all of the cattle barons that need to be taken out. But the very met methodology in which they employ makes them tragic because they're no longer, even though they created civilization or restored civilization, they're not of civilization. And that's tragic because they get no credit. And what I was trying to point out about Trump is he seems to always complain. He'll say, well, I got the economy for, they say I'm racist, but I've got the lowest black and Latino um, unemployment in history. We've got, we've got the most uh, energy production, natural gas in the United States. We're no longer dependent on Mideast oil. I was tougher on Russia than anybody in the Obama. It goes in rails and rails and rails of the injustice of all but not getting credit. And what he doesn't realize is that 46% of the country elected him not to give him credit, but because he was an outsider with certain skill sets to come in and deal with the Chinese mercantilism and unfair trade and the hollowing out of the industrial interior, uh, non-enforcement of immigration law, uh, so-called optional wars in the Middle East that in a strategic sense didn't, in a cost-benefit analysis sense, didn't pencil out. And once he did that, then he wouldn't be either necessarily thanked or acknowledged, but he would have got them done because he was not part of the system. So the Republican establishment, the pundit class, they hated him as much as the left did. And so I don't think he understood that he was in a tragic role. And tragic doesn't mean bad or good. It just means that you've created the very conditions under which you're going to benefit somebody else, but not yourself. And you're going to be angry over that unchangeable and unalterable fact. Uh, so does that mean he's fated to end up like Antigone or Ajax? Yes, I think he is. I mean, he was on TV this morning. He didn't look very well. 74 years old. He's too heavy. He's stressed out. People who he's down in the polls, I think he still probably will win. But I think that when he's, whether he's out of the presidency in 2000. 20 uh, or 2000, excuse me, 21 or 25. I don't think he's gonna be invited to funerals with other presidents. I don't think NPR is gonna have him on to josh around with George W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama. I don't think when you get your annual ratings of presidents evaluations by our eminent academic historians, I don't think he's gonna be rated in the way that they might have rated other people that had a particular effect on GDP or unemployment or energy production or foreign affairs. It's just not going to happen to it. It's interesting, though, because I, I mean, it's always cyclical. I mean, I, I don't live in America and I haven't lived in America for a very long time. So I, not to, to feel grandiose if, in any regard, but I almost feel like Thucydides sometimes because, I, you know, I'm always on the outside looking in. Um, and you're when you're not in it, you, you don't feel it the same way than when you're looking 
um, outwards in. And, and it seems like, you know, people complain so much about George W. Bush and now, oh, he's fine. He's kind of a lovable character. It, it's amazing. You, you think of every Roman emperor, they always think this one's really the worst at the time. But then with time, they think actually that one wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, it's right out of Suetonius. It always starts the same. If you read Suetonius with an uncritical eye, then you say, well, wow, Caligula was horrible, and then Claudius was a dunce, and then Nero was was horrible, and then we had the four emperors. And then, but when you read it less, uh, more critically, you can see that a lot of the criticism is of the person in office at the time. There's sort of a trope, a Suetonian trope in America that because the universities, the foundations, the entertainment industry, and especially the media tend to be left of center, they look at a Republican president as a threat, an existential threat to their whole progressive agenda. So when George H.W. Bush, say, got elected in 88 with the help of Lee Outwater, who ran a, what I would call a pretty tough campaign analogous to what James Carville would do four years later with Bill Clinton, then he was horrible. He ran a tank commercial against Dukakis. He had a Willie Horton commercial. He was a wimp. News, you know, he was just a terrible guy. Then he was out, and we had the Clinton years, and then we had George W. Bush. And after his initial popularity after 9 11 waned, and we got into the acrimonious years of the Iraq War, then why couldn't he be more like his statesmanlike centrist father, the aristocrat blue stocking? We didn't really like him, but. He was a sober and judicious father figure. Instead, he was a Texas twangy, ex-drunk. He was horrible. He's a Nazi, a brown, I think Al Gore said he was a brown shirt. John Glenn said he was Nazi-like. We had the whole Cindy Sheehan, Michael Moore, and we went through the Nazi thing. There were op-eds, I think, in The Guardian, correct me if I'm wrong, and said, where's John Wilkes Booth when we need him? Pretty tough stuff. Then he's gone. Now we have Donald Trump, and lo and behold, George W. Bush was a sober and judicious president. And we did the same thing with Reagan. They hated Reagan. They said, Reagan is the most polarizing person. And now Reagan is the godfather of bipartisanship. And I don't know if that'll happen with Trump. It depends on who replaces him. If we go back to the, uh, the Marcus of Queensberry rules Republicans, then yeah, he will not be rehabilitated. But if we get a populist nationalist in the Trump tradition who is successful, at some point the, the left will say, you know, why couldn't he be more like Donald Trump? Donald Trump was not that bad. Yeah, you, you, we only see these things with hindsight, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Classical Wisdom Society members can listen to the entire podcast on classicalwisdom.com.